All right, today we're moving on from the internal cell structures and organelles to all things plasma membrane. I'm going to talk about the structure of the plasma membrane, but then also about the functionality of it and the transport that occurs across it. So the plasma membrane is going to provide the following functions. Physical isolation between the internal, cellular, and external environments. Regulation of nutrient and waste exchange. Sensing changes in the environment or receiving communication signals from other parts of the body. So this is how cells are going to communicate with each other and how chemical message, mess, messages sorry, are going to get sent from one part of the body to another. There's going to be a receptor in the plasma membrane that's going to receive those signals. And then connecting to other cells, giving body tissues a stable structure. So if you remember from yesterday's notes, I talked about how cells are connected to each other with tight junctions, gap junctions, desmosomes. Um, the cell membrane is actually what's going to help those things be achieved, depending on what type of tissue it is. Right, so those are the four main functions of the plasma membrane. The main component of the plasma membrane is going to be the phospholipid. And so remember we talked about the phospholipid a few days ago. It is under the macromolecule class of lipid, obviously as the name implies. And remember what is so unique about the phospholipids are that they are not completely hydrophobic. They have a phosphate head and you can see the phosphate is highlighted here. And because phosphates are negatively charged, they're going to be attracted to the partial positive charges of water. And then you have these fatty acid tails, and those are the hydrophobic parts. So phosphate head is hydrophilic, fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. And this is why we do not dissolve whenever we get like into a swimming pool, is because our cell membranes are made up of these fatty acid tails right here that are hydrophobic, that don't dissolve in water. And so this is what I, I just said, that the two fatty acid tails are hydrophobic and soluble in water, and the phosphate head is hydrophilic, which is water soluble. So the basic design of the cell membrane is what's called a bilayer, meaning it's two layers. And you notice that hydro, the hydrophobic tails of one layer are going to face the hydrophobic tails of another layer. So anything that's hydrophobic, that's fatty, waxy, lipid-like, is kind of, they're going to behave kind of like the name implies, like they're scared of water. And so these tails are going to turn in on each other and they're gonna form kind of this in, you know, not completely impenetrable, but a uh, semi um, permeable layer or membrane. And it is called a semi permeable membrane because what can get through these things are going to be small molecules or other lipid molecules. So you have your hydrophilic heads on the outside and your hydrophobic tails on the inside, and that's what creates the bilayer. All right, so just a few things about the, um, the, the lipid bilayer. Um, the membrane is going to adjust itself for temperature. So it's just kind of something important to mention is that the membrane isn't just sitting there. It actually is going to have adjustments in it. It's gonna undergo its own kind of homeostasis during certain temperatures. So when temperatures are low, what tends to happen to fats and oils is that they solidify, right? So I'm thinking of like a plant, like winter wheat, that is going to be exposed to really low temperatures. How does that type of plant that lives in really cold temperatures, how does it its membranes adjust to those cold temperatures so that they don't pack together and form a solid? So what's gonna happen is that the phospholipid tails, these um, tails right here, are going to form double bonds between the carbons, causing them to be unsaturated tails, and they're gonna kind of kink. Do you see how they kick out right here? 
all right? So this is what they normally look like. If you're looking at this right picture, this is what they normally look like, just straight tails, no double bonds. But then when it gets really cold, the membrane will adjust itself by creating double bonds between some of the carbons and the tails will kink out. So this is going to prevent them from packing too close together and, forming, and forming solids. There is also cholesterol embedded within that's going to also keep them. So remember, cholesterol is a steroid and it is composed of these four fused rings and it is a hydrocarbon, so it is hydrophobic. So it will embed itself within the phospholipid bilayer to prevent close packing together and solidifying during cold temperatures. Cholesterol is also going to help in high temperatures. So in low temperatures, you have double bonds kinking. You also have cholesterol, keeps from packing together. In high temperatures, so what happens when it's hot? When, what happens when you put butter in the microwave? It's going to melt. Well, in high temperatures, we don't want cell membranes to melt. So cholesterol, once again, is going to be embedded within the membrane that's going to prevent the cell membrane from becoming liquefied or melting. So pretty much what I'm trying to convey to you here is that the membrane <clears throat> is going to adjust itself depending on temperature and that cholesterol plays a really, really, really important part to maintaining the integrity of the cell membrane, the lipid bilayer. And so here are just a couple examples. So bacteria that live in a hot spring, what are they going to have a lot of in their membrane? They're going to have a lot of cholesterol. Winter wheat that could possibly freeze, what's it going to have in its membrane? It's going to have a lot of double bonds causing kinks. It's also going to have a lot of cholesterol. So cholesterol is very, very important to maintaining the cell membrane. All right, moving on to membrane proteins. So proteins, remember, are one of our major, our macromolecules. How are you going to recognize a protein? It is made up of the atoms. C H O N S. All right, so C H O N S. And proteins are made up of amino acids. And remember, the folding of a protein is very important. And you're going to find a lot of proteins embedded within and kind of hanging off of the side of the cell membrane. So, integral proteins are going to be embedded within the membrane. And in order for a membrane, for a protein or an integral protein to be embedded within the membrane, it is going to have to have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties, which makes sense. Because if a, if a protein is going to span this entire layer right here, the interior of the protein is going to be hydrophobic and the, um, the bottom and the top here are going to be hydrophilic. Right? So it has to have both properties. And remember I had said when something is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, that means it's amphipathic. Amphipathic. Peripheral proteins are going to be extracellular or cytoplasmic. So that means they're either going to be hanging off of the membrane on the outside of the cell or they're going to be hanging off of the membrane on the inside of the cell. They're not embedded within. And then they can be held in place by the cytoskeleton or something called the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix, I'm just going to show you right here on this picture, is the outside of the cell membrane. The extracellular matrix is on the outside of the cell membrane, and it's composed of proteins and carbohydrates that just also help keep the integrity of the cell. All right, so this picture is going to show you um, integral proteins and peripheral proteins. There's an integral protein, there's an integral protein, here's a peripheral protein on the cytoplasmic side, here's a, I'm sorry, here's a peripheral protein on the cytoplasmic side, and here's a peripheral protein on the extracellular side. So if it's embedded within, it's an uh, integral protein. If it's on the sides, it's a peripheral protein. Hopefully I didn't get my words too mixed up there. So the proteins that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer are going to determine most of the membrane specific functions, right? So they can um, function like enzymes, they can function like receptors that are going to take in chemical signals. Um, they're very, very, very important. Okay, this is just showing you that word amphipathic that I said a minute ago. So if a protein, transmembrane and integral are used interchangeably, 
So a transmembrane protein and an integral protein, those words are used interchangeably. In order to span the entire membrane, you're going to have to have a hydrophobic part and then two hydrophilic parts. And so don't worry about N-terminus, C-terminus, don't worry about any of those. All I really want you to know is the word amphipathic means it has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties. And so in order to span the entire membrane, it's gonna to have to have a hydrophobic interior and hydrophilic ends. So these are chemistry concepts. So for students, typically students who have taken chemistry are taking cell bio. This summer though, we've opened it up to students who have not taken chemistry. So if any hydrophobic, hydrophilic, um, any chemistry concepts get you kind of tripped up, I am gonna need you to um, contact me on the side so that we can go over some of these words for you and get some of this chemistry stuff um, taken care of for those of you that haven't taken chemistry. All right, so what are some functions of membrane proteins? So I said some of them can act like enzymes. Some of them can be involved in cell signaling, but there's also a few more. So some of them are involved in transport. So if there's something that can't pass through the lipid bilayer that needs to get into or out of the cell, it can pass through a protein. We said enzymes, which are going to speed up the rate of chemical reactions. Signal transduction, so if a signaling molecule needs to send a signal to, into a cell, it's gonna dock onto a receptor and then the receptor itself is gonna send the signal. Cell-to-cell -cell recognition, so there's carbohydrates that are hanging off of proteins. So this is, um, relates to blood type. What gives you your blood type is the type of carbohydrate that's hanging off of a protein that's embedded in, your, in the cell membrane. And so cells are gonna recognize other cells by the carbohydrate that is hanging off of a protein that is embedded within a membrane. And we'll talk a lot about blood typing a little bit later when we get into genetics. Intercellular joining. So remember I talked about tight junctions that exist between your skin cells that cause a watertight seal. Those are proteins that are embedded within the membrane that are causing that to happen. And then attachment to the cytoskeleton on the inside. So remember there's parts of, there's certain types of cytoskeletons gonna maintain the shape and support inside the cell. And so they're attached to that, but then they're also attached to this thing called an extracellular matrix. Extracellular matrix, if you hadn't gotten that down a second ago when I talked about it, um, I'm gonna show you another picture on the next slide that shows it, but the ECM, I would take a moment just to look at this, Extracellular matrix, also known as ECM, extracellular matrix, also known as ECM, is going to be made up of chains of proteins and carbohydrates that exist on the outside of the cell that's there for protection. And here's a really great picture. So here is the ECM right here. This is the outside of the cell. It almost looks like a barbed wire fence. And that's a really good way to visualize it as a barbed wire fence, because what does a barbed wire fence do? It protects like invaders from getting it in or um, yeah, it protects, but it does a little bit more than that. This is gonna help cells adhere to other cells. This is gonna help a little bit with cell signaling. So the ECM is made up of proteins and carbohydrates, again, that help protect the cell that surround the outside of the cell. All right, anytime you see the color purple in this class, that's referring to protein. Anytime you see the color green, it's prefer referring to carbohydrates. All right, so just in case, and that will apply to AP Bio too. We've just color coded them. Green will be carbohydrate, purple will be protein. All right, so carbohydrates that are actually hanging off of the cell membrane, like I said before, are involved in cell-to-cell -cell recognition. That's what gives you your blood type, is the type of carbohydrate that's hanging off of your red blood cells. This is what makes blood transfusions difficult, obviously, because you have to be compatible with the blood that you get. This is what makes organ transplants um, so um, difficult, is if you get an organ in your body that has a carbohydrate hanging off of it that your other cells do not recognize, your immune system will attack it. So that's why you have to find um, organ donors that are also compatible. And then we have these two words, glycolipid and glycoprotein. Anytime you see G-L-Y-C, glyc, it has to do with sugar, it has to do with carbohydrates. And so you can probably assume if it's glycolipid, it's a carbohydrate that's hanging off of a lipid, like this. If it's glycoprotein, it's a carbohydrate that's hanging off of a protein on the cell membrane. 
But really what I'd like for you to know from this slide is that carbohydrates that are hanging off of the cell membrane are going to um, be responsible for cell to cell recognition. And then I'd already talked about that. All right. Let's talk about the permeability of the lipid bilayer. So now that we've talked about all the components of it, all the parts of it, let's talk about its function. So the lipid bilayer having both hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts, but with the interior of it being hydrophobic, that means there's a bunch of things that cannot pass through. Some things can, but some things can't. And so that's what makes it selectively permeable. Kind of like this dude standing right here. You can imagine he's probably standing outside of a really sophisticated nightclub. And some people that walk up to him, he is like, mm-hmm, you are on the list. I will let you through. And he opens this little red gate right here. And then some people that walk up, he's like, I'm sorry, you're not on this list. You cannot come through. And so those people that get, aren't on the list that couldn't come through, they're going to have to find some secret door to go through. Um, and that would be a protein. But we're just talking about molecules trying to get through the lipid bilayer just by itself on its own. And so this visual right here is going to show you what exactly can and cannot get through the lipid bilayer. So what can get through? Nonpolar molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide, hormones made of lipids like testosterone and estrogen, because remember I told you a couple days ago, cholesterol is the precursor to estrogen and testosterone, meaning estrogen and testosterone are gonna have four fused rings, they're gonna be hydrocarbons, they're gonna be hydrophobic, therefore those types of hormones can pass through the lipid bilayer unaided. What also can pass through the lipid bilayer, notice right here, small polar molecules like water and ethanol. I'm more concerned with you knowing that water, even though it has partial charges and it's polar, it's small enough where it can pass through. But I'd like for you to make a little note that it is slow. There are some cells that need water to come into and out of quickly, like your kidney cells, that are going to need help. So water can slowly diffuse through if it really needs to. If it really wants to, it can slowly diffuse out if it really needs to and really wants to. So those are the things that can pass through. What cannot pass through, what cannot pass through are large polar molecules like sugar and ions like sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride ions, those things. Anything that has a full charge, positive or negative, can't pass through. Okay, so those are the things that can and cannot. Proteins, proteins are charged. I mean, think about it, they're 400 amino acids long and you looked at that amino acid list, some amino acids actually have full charges on them or they have partial charges on them and proteins are large. So proteins can't just move through. They can be embedded within, but they can't just move through. Okay, so let's talk about the transport through the lipid bilayer transport through the lipid bilayer that is passive. That means that it doesn't require any energy. So our word for passive transport is going to be diffusion. So diffusion is gonna be the movement of molecules across the lipid bilayer, going from an area of high to low concentration. Therefore, it is passive, meaning it doesn't require energy. It is going along with the natural tendency of what things do in our universe according to certain laws, um, laws of energy. And so to put it simply, um, I like to use this example. So if I'm standing at my desk and I spray myself with like 10 squirts of perfume, eventually at some point, someone sitting back in my lab is going to smell that perfume, but I didn't spray it over by them. So what happened? Due to the laws of the universe and the desire of all molecules to achieve equilibrium and balance, the molecules are going to move from a high to a low concentration to establish equilibrium. That is called diffusion. It's the natural tendency of a molecule to move from one area of high 
to low concentration to establish equilibrium, kind of like the perfume example. This is considered passive transport because there's no energy required. And what the molecules are doing is they're moving down a concentration gradient, moving down from high to low. So they're moving down a concentration gradient. So you can think of it as if you put a lump of sugar in water, eventually the sugar molecules are going to spread out. So you can see that they're spreading out and that's to establish equilibrium. It didn't take any energy to do that. Osmosis is going to be the diffusion of water through channeled proteins or through the lipid bilayer itself, okay? So water is going to diffuse through channel proteins called aquaporins or through the lipid bilayer itself from areas of most high water concentration to low water concentration. And so it's going to, and this is where sometimes students get confused, so where will water move? The general rule of thumb that I would definitely jot down is water is going to move towards solute. Water is going to move towards solute. So if I have a little bit of salt on the outside of the cell and I have a lot of salt on the inside of the cell, which direction is water going to move to establish equilibrium? It's going to move into the cell. Water moves towards solute. All right, and solute can be anything like sugar or salts. A solvent is the liquid, so you would think of water as being the solvent and salt and sugar as being the solutes. Water is going to move towards solute. So if you look at this thing, this is um, what uh, we use to demonstrate osmosis. So in the middle here, you have a selectively permeable membrane. Only water can get through. These purple dots that represent solute can't get through. Only water can get through. So in order to establish equilibrium, in general, we would be like, oh yeah, some of these purple things just need to move over to the other side, but they can't. They can't. They can't move through it. Kind of like they wouldn't be able to move through uh, the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. So what's going to happen is that water is going to move in this direction. That is osmosis to establish equilibrium, and it does establish equilibrium. Per unit area, you have the same concentration of solute. All right, so let's talk about tonicity. There's three types of tonicity. So we're still on the topic of, the, of osmosis and the diffusion of water. You have three types of tonicity, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. Isotonic means that the amount of solute on the outside of the cell is the same as it is on the inside of the cell. Water is moving out and in at the same rate. Therefore, there is no net movement of water. So the concentration of water or I would rather say the concentration of solute is the same on the inside of the cell as it is on the outside of the cell. Therefore, there's no actual net movement of water. It's the same. Okay. This is why when you go to the hospital or you go to an urgent care and you get an IV solution, if you look up at the bag that they're diffusing, you're going to see 0.9% NaCl solution or you're gonna see a lactated ringers, which means it has um, some kind of solute in it. If they diffuse pure distilled water into your, into your veins from your IV, uh, you would not survive that. So um, isotonic is definitely the way. So cells placed in the isotonic solution are unaffected. All right, here's what happens if you would get a, if you got an IV with just plain distilled water. So if you got plain distilled water into your IV, there would be more water on the outside, meaning that the solute would be less concentrated on the outside, more concentrated on the inside. So what happens, water moves towards where there's more solute and the cell is going to burst or lyse. So if there's more water, less solute on the outside of the cell, more solute, less water on the inside of the cell, water moves into the cell and the cell bursts. That's kind of a hypotonic solution. All right, so let's talk about the opposite of a hypotonic solution would be hypertonic. And the way how you would think about the, how you would think of this is there is more solute on the outside of the cell than there is on the inside of the cell. So if there's more solute on the outside of the cell, we would we could say the concentration of water is less. I hate saying that though, because we never talk about concentration of water. I wish this, I, I should have reworded this. The concentration of solute on the outside of the cell is greater than on the inside. Therefore, water moves out. 
And so an example of this is when you go to a restaurant or even if you're at home. I always say when I go to a restaurant because I tend to eat more sodium when I go to a restaurant, especially if they put like a big basket of salty chips in front of me. Um, if you eat something really salty, then you're going to have a lot of sodium floating around on the outside. Water on the inside of the cell is like, hey, ooh, sodium. I'm so attracted to sodium. I want to achieve equilibrium. So water is going to move out of the cell towards the sodium. is going to cause the cell to shrivel, which is going to send a signal to your brain to drink more water. And then eventually... Um, water will start going back into the cell to establish equilibrium because you drank so much water and now um, we're getting more diluted on the outside. So hopefully that kind of made sense. So that's why you swell up. You go to a restaurant, you eat a bunch of sodium, you drink a bunch of water, you swell up because all of that water left the cell. Then you drank a bunch of water and it's filling up this interstitial space right here and then water starts moving back into your cell. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, so the cell shrivels here. All right, so let's talk about this for, for a minute in terms of animals versus plant cells. So remember, plant cells have a cell wall. So it's not going to be quite the same situation. So I'm looking here at isotonic. Remember, isotonic means there is no net movement of water in and out of the cell, and so the cell is unaffected. This makes animal cells very happy. Animal cells are very happy right here. Everything's in equilibrium. Everything's happy. So I put like a little smiley face right there on your notes. All right? Hypotonic is when too much water enters into an animal cell and it bursts. Hypertonic is when too much water leaves an animal cell and it shrivels. So I would say the animal cell is sad right here, I'd put a sad face. Animal cell is sad right here, I'd put a sad face. This is different for plants. Because a plant has a cell wall, it can resist bursting. So what makes a plant cell happy is not isotonic. This is where you see a plant drooping over. It'd be considered flaccid with isotonic. A plant cell is happy with a hypotonic solution. So I'd put a happy face right here, happy face. So a plant is going to be turgid and normal at hypotonic because the cell wall presents, prevents it from bursting. So that central vacuole fills up. Isotonic makes a plant flaccid, and then hypertonic, neither are happy with hypertonic. The plant becomes plasmalized and potentially dead. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. Isotonic makes plants, uh, makes animal cells happy. Hypotonic makes plant cells happy. And then I would definitely know the word plasma, plasmolysis. So um, that means that um, the cell membrane starts collapsing inward. So you can see the cell membrane, the cell wall is still there, but the cell membrane starts collapsing inward. And I do have an exercise um, where we, plat we pass salt water through a uh, red onion. And you can actually see the cell membrane like collapsing in on itself. It's pretty cool. Under the microscope, you can see that. It's pretty cool. All right. Moving on to a different type of movement. All right. So this is called facilitated diffusion. So this is still diffusion, and I did talk about it a little bit with water already, but it's not just water that gets a protein to help it move. Um, facilitated diffusion is still the process of going from a high to a low concentration. Doesn't require any energy, um, but it does re but it does require a channel protein. So facilitated diffusion is diffusion across a cell membrane with the help of a protein. So in some forms of membrane transport, the protein is gonna aid in the movement of molecules across the membrane. And this process works with the concentration gradient is called facilitated diffusion. That means going from a high to a low concentration does not require energy. This process is often used when the molecule is too big or too polar to pass through the cell membrane on its own. And so glucose can go from high to low concentration using a membrane protein. Like I said, water, frequently will use a membrane protein, although water doesn't always have to. Um, ions, like sodium ions, they can move from a high to a low concentration using a membrane protein or a channel protein. That is called facilitated diffusion, okay? And that's really all I'm gonna say about facilitated diffusion. It's diffusion across the membrane of molecules that can't readily cross the membrane, like sugars and ions, and sometimes water, and it's gonna use a membrane protein to help it. All right, active transport. 
active transport is um, using a membrane protein, except it's like facilitated diffusion in that it uses a membrane protein, except at this time, molecules are being pumped against their concentration gradient, against. And so this is going to require energy in the form of ATP, and that is why it's called active transport. Molecules are getting pumped against their concentration gradient. So when do we see this happening? We see this happening when, um, I don't want to get too far into the topic um, because it might be a little too advanced, but most of the time you're going to see active transport when ions are getting pumped against their concentration gradient. So let me show you an example. Ooh, that's blurry. Hopefully it's not too blurry on your paper. Um, this is showing you hydrogen ions, and hydrogen is considered an ion here because it's an H+, so it has a positive charge. You have this thing called the proton pump that's going to actively, using ATP, pump hydrogens out against their concentration gradient. So it's going against the natural tendency. So instead of equalizing hydrogens on both sides, this proton pump wants more hydrogens on the outside than it does on the inside. So if hydrogens are positively charged, what's that going to do to the charge of the outside versus the inside? Well, if you see in this picture here, it's going to make the outside really, really positively charged while making the inside really negatively charged. What this does is it sets the cell up for what's called an electrochemical gradient, and it sets the cell up for the ability to do work. Because what do these hydrogens desperately want to do? They want to rush back into the cell to establish equilibrium. And so this is going to play a really important part when we get to cellular respiration and photosynthesis in the production of ATP. So I want you just to kind of keep in the back of your mind that the cell wants to set up this huge difference in charge so that when it's ready, it's gonna open up almost like a floodgate and hydrogens are gonna rush back in. And in the process of hydrogens rushing back in, work gets done, actual mechanical work gets done for the cell. And I will go back to that later. Another example of active transport of ions is the sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump is going to pump out three sodiums, pump them out, you see how it's pumping out three sodiums, and then it's going to pump in two potassiums. So if you think about that, there's a lot of negatively charged ions and proteins on the inside of the cell. So if you're pumping out three positives, and for every three positives you're only bringing in two positives, eventually the outside of the cell is going to become more positive than the inside, causing there to be a difference in charge, causing what's also known as a membrane potential, and that's what causes um, neurons to fire. So if you have lots of positives on the outside and negatives on the inside of the cell, at some point a gate is going to open and all the positives are going to rush in, and so that's the basis of neurons firing also. So really, that gets us a little bit too deep into some topics um, that would be covered in anatomy and in AP. All I really want you to know is proton pump pumps hydrogens against their concentration gradient. The sodium-potassium pump pumps sodium and potassium against their concentration gradient. Therefore, both are examples of active transport and both need ATP. And so I use these two terms, membrane potential and electrochemical gradient. That's what is being um, achieved when you pump ions against their concentration gradient. All right, last uh, type of transport, and this is actually the last page of your notes. We will get this done in under 40 minutes. That's awesome. It's called vesicular transport. This also requires ATP. So vesicular transport also requires ATP. That's what you're going to fill in that blank. Also requires ATP. Cells can move large amounts of materials at the same time through membranous sacs called vesicles. So these are things that are way too big for a transport protein embedded in the membrane. When material is imported into the cell, it's called endocytosis. And when material is exported out of the cell, it's called exocytosis. And this uses membrane. So get those blanks filled in. <clears throat> 
endocytosis bringing it in, exocytosis it's exiting and it's using mem the membrane to bring it in and then it's forming vesicles. Remember vesicles were those like those little bubbles I was talking about that look like they're like the little cars of the cell. They're made out of lipid bilayer, they're made out of membrane. And so if you look at this picture right here, a foreign object comes in, it basically buds inwards, forms a vesicle out of that original membrane. Lysosomes are going to merge with it. So this is like phagocytosis. So let's pretend this is a bacteria right here that's being engulfed. A vesicle forms around it. So membrane, a membrane lipid bilayer forms around it. Lysosomes are going to fuse. And remember, lysosomes have those things called hydrolytic enzymes. Chops up the bacteria, chops it up, chops it up, releases it. All right, so this is endocytosis, exocytosis. So we're not using, things are not going across the lipid bilayer using membrane proteins or anything like that. It's actually using the lipid bilayer. The lipid bilayer is surrounding it as it tr gets transported through the cell. And then eventually that vesicle fuses with the lipid bilayer and releases the contents. All right, so different types of endocytosis. You have penocytosis, which is called cellular drinking. So two types of endocytosis, bringing it in, using the lipid bilayer, forming vesicles. Penocytosis is called cellular drinking, and the cell is taking in large amounts of liquids at one time. And then phagocytosis is cellular eating when the cell takes in large solid objects. So a large uh, white blood cell engulfing a bacteria would be called phagocytosis. So penocytosis and phagocytosis are two types of endocytosis. Pino meaning liquid, phago meaning solid. All right, and I think that's actually it. Um, we didn't have different types of exo because exocytosis is gonna be the same. Um, that's it, you have a picture down at the bottom that shows you um, another visual of phagocytosis bringing in a solid penocytosis, bringing in liquids. And then you have receptor-mediated endocytosis. And I put that there because that actually is important. Receptor-mediated endocytosis um, is the way that viruses actually get into a cell. So a virus will have a protein that matches a receptor on the um, cell membrane, and it will dock, and the cell membrane will be like, sure, come on in, and it'll form a little vesicle around the virus, and the virus gets in takes over the host machinery, and we all know what happens after that. So a person can get very, very sick. All right, so these are um, all of the different types of um, transport into a cell. Um, this is a very, very important chapter, um, and there are some exercises you're going to do. You're going to do a lab where you use dialysis tubing, which mimics the cell membrane, and using starch and iodine. And then you're going to do a bubble membrane lab where you're reviewing the uh, properties of the cell membrane uh, using bubbles, which is pretty fun. And then you're going to do an exercise where you review the types of cellular transport. All right, and I will have gone over everything in the Zoom if we hadn't done the Zoom already. Okay, I will talk to you guys later.